Hello, and welcome to this new season of the Learning Future podcast, Education Transformed. Today, it's my delight to have this wonderful colleague and friend of mine, Dominic Register, joining us. Dominic is the Director of Education and the Director of the Center for Education Transformation at Salzburg Global Seminar, where he's responsible for designing, developing, and implementing programs on the futures of education, with a particular focus on social and emotional learning, education leadership, regenerative education, and critically, education transformation. He has a wonderful suite of skills and has had a wonderful career in education and beyond, working for the British Council for 14 years in global citizenship, uh, and also now works on a broad range of education projects, including as a director for Amal Alliance, a senior editor for Diplomatic Courier, an advisor to the Learning Economy Foundation, and the power of zero. Since 2021, we've actually worked together as he served as the executive director of Karanga, the Global Alliance for Social Emotional Learning and Life Skills, and he holds two master's degrees, one in Chinese studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, and in Education and International Development from the Institute of Education at UCL. That's a great bio, Dominic. It's great to be speaking with you. Nice to be back. Thank you, Luca. Man, it's always always good to, to be able to kind of loop around and, and realize what's changed, what are we noticing through our work? And, and this is the first question that I have for you and all the guests that we've had on this season so far, which is, why do we need education transformation? Why is that what we're speaking about here today instead of, oh, we can, you know, tweak it or improve it slightly? So it's a great opening question. We, we, you know, obviously we, since we last spoke, one of the big changes at Salzburg Global has been we've established this Center for Education Transformation. So, you know, institutionally, as much as personally, we believe very strongly in the importance of this at this moment in time. And I think there's there's a number of, of really compelling reasons why the transformation agenda is gaining so much mm. momentum and why the idea of, of kind of incremental reform or improvement is no longer enough, no longer good enough. So you know, I think globally, we've been through some really significant societal upheavals and changes in the last few years and there's a growing recognition that how education systems were organized before we went into these periods of, of transition and, and upheaval was contributing to the status quo that it contributed to the problems that, that these big changes have looked to address so mm -hmm. things like um, institutional racism and uh, the way in which so many societies weren't nearly as inclusive as they should be. Um, yes. Things like yeah. institutional sexism, ingrained societal sexism. Um, you know, so so it's, you know, obviously we're talking about things like Black Lives Matters, we're talking about the Me Too movement and the way, you know, these are long overdue, really powerful reckonings, re recalibrations to try and address long-term systemic inequalities. Um, you know, that were in many ways a, a product or an output of the kind of education systems that all of us had grown up in, everyone who held power in a way that perpetuated those kinds of inequalities was a product of their education systems. And those education systems were increasingly part of the, you know, part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And the idea of incremental reform wasn't getting us where we needed to get fast enough. Um, so that, that's part of the answer. Um, yeah. I think there is also the kind of collective global experience of the pandemic and how that has changed ideas about the, the purpose of education and what's really fundamentally important. Um, you know, at one point in 2020, 90% of school-aged children around the world weren't in school. And the mm. things that they were missing and the things that parents and caregivers saw them really missing when school was removed from their lives were not necessarily the things that school systems spend most of their time on. So it wasn't about preparing for standardized tests, for example. It was about the, the kind of human and social interaction. Um, yeah. And carrying on with that, there's so much more data and understanding about global mental health crises now. Um, the pandemic has exacerbated and accelerated a lot of those trends, but they were visible pre-pandemic. Um, there wasn't, you know, the vast majority of education systems didn't give enough weight or importance to issues of mental health and well-being. Um, so you've had, you know, all of these 
quite profound moments of or opportunities for for recalibration rethinking the role that education plays in helping to create societies that will be better for the people who live in them and better for the planet you know the, to carry on with those kind of macro trends which are shaping a lot of the transformation agenda the climate crisis mm. um is you know probably the one which is most genuinely existential of all of those different trends we talked about um so far education systems in the vast majority of contexts were in lots of ways contributing to the climate crisis because of the connection with capitalist thinking and the emphasis they place on um sort of zero sum mentality and that mm. there have to be winners and losers and the ways in which this is driven you know kind of part of the the sort of big part aspect of the extractive culture um yeah. which yes. is contributing yeah. to the climate yeah. crisis they don't forefront cooperation um they forefront competition and if we are to find a way out of climate crisis in particular there needs to be much greater understanding of empathy of the social and emotional skills that you and I talk about through the Karanga work um about how do you cooperate um across societies across populations um and education hasn't previously forefronted that um so there's all these these kind of things from the very recent past um that are driving this and then the final part of the answer I think is is the sort of political economy around the sustainable development goals and the fact that every UN member state was committed mm. to the 2030 agenda, but no one is on track to meet their SDG4 um, targets, let alone you know, the, the other 16 targets. The deadline is supposedly 2030. I think we will see an increase in political attention and media attention to where countries are off track, and that creates a different kind of, of dynamic an urgency for political leadership and you know I think quite favorable conditions for for being more radical and thinking about a more profound kind of transformation mm. so there's yeah I think there's there's the urgency and there's also the opportunity over the next seven years as we get through to 2030. I think it's something that's put so beautifully and I just think about some of your work and our work there you know there's different statements that have been put out by Salzburg Global Seminar you know under your leadership um that are really articulating this is the kind of directionality we need to go to. Um, and, you know, I, I'm also, I just recall even this year, you know, the UNGA having the Transforming Education Summit, you know, I think for one of the first times in recent memory where education and its transformation has been the language expressed by that kind of political economy space. Um, I would love you to take us into, you know, the kind of the compelling case for why I think is 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 becoming more obvious to practically everybody. Um, but I think you talked about the opportunity thing, you know, the, the Overton window from political theory, what's considered feasible to do within a policy frame being kind of thrown open in the middle of all these crises and all of a sudden, uh, you know, transforming the way hundreds of millions, in fact, more than a billion, 1.6 billion or whatever it was, children were learning overnight wasn't, seen as impossible it was considered as necessary and of course it's you know the difference between schooling and learning and as you say the social elements of schools are what young people miss the most and frankly educators as well they kind of they are social contexts how do you see this playing out what are the big drivers or levers for true education transformation to take place not just the improvement paradigm which is you know yes we are trying to close equity gaps in traditional achievement but actually we might be able to do that through a transformation what are you what are you seeing through your work if we were to think of the different lenses that are required probably the the clearest expression of this is the is um through the work of big change and the new education story that came out um at the beginning of this year and you know, in in that, and it's recommended to all of your listeners because it's a fantastic put it in the um, show notes. Document actually, and, it's fabulous. Yeah, great. And there's a lot, and I think you've got Karen coming on, Karen Goddard coming on as a guest later in the in the season, um, who can talk much more eloquently about this because she was instrumental in in writing it and shaping it. But um, you know, what the way big change 
would answer your question, I think, is the sort of focus on the three critical levers for change of power, purpose, and practice. Um, and we were lucky, with, you know, as you know, because you were here in May, but um, the part, the program that we did on education futures that produced the statement on education transformation um, was was in partnership with Big Change, and we were um, we referenced the new education story a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, in the program and in the statement that we put out and in the, the essay collection that came out um, in September. But yeah, understanding our purpose of education is shifting in mm. different societies around the world. Um, understanding where power lies in systems and how that power needs to change, needs to shift and be shared um, in ways that it hasn't been before in order to to bring in this new kind of education system. And then the very practice of education, you know, where does it happen? Um, what are the dominant pedagogies? What are the what are the core subjects in a curriculum? Um, you know, one of the, the big pandemic takeaways, and I think one of the issues with the phrase learning loss, yeah. um, which is used a lot, you know, is that learning didn't stop. It was happening in different places. And the learning, and this, you know, this is a kind of Andreas Schleicher, quote but you know the learning learning continued it just might not have been the learning that the system attached importance to before the pandemic but people yes. and children in particular didn't stop learning so recognizing that so you no know, what we found with the program here earlier this year and i i believe very strongly is that you know it's not we're not going to be able to support or help work with countries around the world who are engaging in transformation if we're if kind of organizations that, that operate at a global level are too prescriptive or offering you know telling people what you need to do or haranguing people mm. into how you do it it's, it's not going to you know it's completely the wrong mindset and the wrong approach yeah um, because the transformation journey will be different in every country because each system is starting from um from a different place um and what what big change do beautifully and what what we've you know emulated in lots of ways in the statement that we put out um with them and all the other participants is is thinking about the kind of critical questions that system leaders could be asking themselves at the beginning of this transformation journey as they start to bring together the kind of right coalitions and alliances within their own systems that are going to help you know shape and then deliver on on a new new approach to education and this mm. will be massively different in, in in each system what what is you know what is really interesting i think at, at the moment is the countries a lot of the countries which are going further and, and fastest with this work are you know are countries which are not typically associated with radical education innovation they're not the countries which dominate the pisa league tables for examples Indeed. it's a really broad spectrum of countries that have you know had the right kind of political leadership um at this point in time to be able to recognize the urgency and the importance and then lean into the work um fairly quickly and you know and it is at the everyone is at the beginning of this so you know there is a kind of rhetoric reality lag inevitably at this point in time but there are lots of really encouraging signals that this this is going to the next seven years will deliver on the promise and potential yes i i, I remember dominic the uh like this one of one of the off often cited quotes um which i cite far too often from Malcolm. you know it's this idea that um the future's already here it's just unevenly distributed and so often when we think about what's happening and i think your your comment on context is so powerful you know i often reflect context is queen you know it really does determine everything and so we, this idea of just here's the program and implement it doesn't seem, I don't think ever worked, frankly. But certainly now I think there's a more appreciation that this has to be done in a co-designed fashion you know, because the contextual elements that standardize systems and perhaps just kind of operational models or improvement models may not pay enough attention to are what determine ultimately the short-term and long-term success. It's like, is this held by the community? Is this co-constructed, co-authored? Is this evolved contextually, linguistically, culturally? So I really, I really resonate with that point. I, I wonder if you could point us to the idea of, you know, there being some some systems taking steps forward. Which which are the ones that you would identify? I have a few in my mind, but I'd love to know 
Like what are the what are the kind of countries that you think are exploring some of this education transformation work um, in interesting ways now that might not be the usual Finland suspects? Um, I was lucky to be at the Transforming Education Summit in New York just before Unger, and it, there were there were definitely you know, there were countries that were much more visible um, in in the work in in the transformation work, and were given much more profile because they had more to share mm. at this point in time. So Sierra Leone is a good example under the leadership of Minister David Sengate. Uh, who's been education minister there for a couple of years is um, doing really powerful work, I think, around intergenerational leadership, around gender transformative education. The Freetown Declaration um, is a very powerful document looking at the, you know, the power of gender transformative education. Um, a lot of really strong commitments within Sierra Leone. You know, as I said, everyone is at the beginning mm. of this journey. But um, so Sierra Leone, I think um, Belize, uh, mm -hmm. With Minister Fonseca doing some really interesting work. You heard a lot from them. Um, Greece is doing some powerful work. Finland, who you mentioned, you know, is also you know at the forefront in many ways for education transformation, um, and has been doing quite radical experiments with curriculum and curriculum design and learning journeys over the last few years, even before the pandemic. Yes. Um, Niger, uh, Malawi. Um, there's some exciting things happening in different parts of Canada. Um, so it's a it's an interesting you know broad spectrum of countries from around the world that mm. are doing powerful work. So they're, they're just the ones which are sort of top of mind from New York. Yeah, there are many more as well. I wonder, Dominic, if you were to, and I think because of your position in this ecosystem, you may have a good reflection on this. But if you were to reflect on, I, I guess, the ambitions of education systems globally, like, and you were to place them in three different groupings what one group that are really on this transformation journey they're trying to align an ecosystem approach they have a clear vision or or declaration or statement they are trying to shift power they have capacity building work going on they may have some significant curriculum reform transformation but it's a group one group two which is in some ways is kind of really going at a from an improvement paradigm and group three that it may just not be on the agenda at all like what what kind of distribution do you think we see at this kind of global level around the member states of the UN, at least, you know, all the World Education Forum and other bodies that, that you're often involved with? What's your reflection on, on the kind of the state of education transformation globally right now? But there is a momentum building around the rhetoric of transformation. Um, and there is a really, I, ho I hope, a really you know useful role that organisations like Salzburg Global Seminar can play in, in kind of supporting the, the conversion of, of that rhetoric into reality of kind of being able to um, create connections across different systems so that mm. you know key actors in different countries who are in positions to to affect change and transformation are able to connect and learn with each other um, because it is a you know it's a kind of exciting new um, future where you know transformation on this scale hasn't happened in this way before um, yeah. so there's a huge amount of global learning taking place but I I think you know it there was during the to take to take one example of um the, you know, so, so one aspect of transformed education systems that I know you and I really hope will be much more visible in many more places, the kind of prominence of social and emotional learning as, you know, within education. And yes. you, you, might, you might remember back in 2020 with Karanga, we did that piece of social media analysis where we were looking at the frequency with which terms like social emotional learning, SEL, variations mm -hmm. only in english but the frequency with which those terms were used across multiple social media platforms during 2020 and what we saw you know was that there was a kind of really significant increase in frequency of usage yeah. as the pandemic really kicked in and school closures 
um, began to bite and take hold. And, you know, you had, I, I forget, the, I can find the, the graph for you if you want to include it, but, you know, you, you had by kind of June, July of 2020, four or five times the frequency of usage, if not more than in January of that year. And then yeah. come the autumn when schools yeah. were reopening, um, frequency tailed off. And you know, social media usage of a particular phrase is only a proxy indicator of the, the amount of attention, but it's sort of not um, unreasonable proxy indicator. And so when, when school systems, when schools were able to reopen, um, there was a return to systems doing what they knew how to do mm. um, because that's what they were set up for. And, and it felt like the kind of interest, the global interest in social emotional learning as a reform tool tailed off. Um, yeah. But it was still higher by the end of the year than it was at the start of the year. So, so there was some degree in which um, progress has been made to a certain extent. And I think we're seeing that with a lot of you know, systems globally. You're, you're seeing you know, th th there is a kind of tension between the build back better yeah. sort of narrative and the reality of what is possible in in the short term when schools are open when you know the, the kind of need for connection and all you know everything people are coming back together and returning to doing what they what they know how to do mm. and the transformation work is happening alongside that as it as it needs to because um you can't stop stop the learning and you know there's that moral responsibility for the children who are in the system um, to make sure they come out of it with with things that are useful for them to use in future life. Yeah, I, I, exactly. I really feel like the the distinction between schooling and learning we've been discussing here, Dominic, as well. You know, that if you if you focus on learning, it's informal, non formal, and formal context. It's social, emotional, and cognitive, perhaps physical and spiritual as well. It's multi dimensional, and I, I do think there's this real tension that we're experiencing here. Um, which is, which in some cases, trying to keep the lights on. Like, I, I know, notably, we haven't discussed it here yet, but there is this kind of the the amount of strain that teachers are experiencing uh, in many parts of the world is astronomical. I saw a recent data here that shows sixty percent of educators in Australia are considering leaving teaching. Now, that's a cataclysm in terms of profession. And so clearly, that's another element here that calls for a transformation, not just so that it's learner centered. But so that it's human centered, so that the, the human beings, the adults that are holding these learning processes, designing and delivering them, you know, from very under, under complex situations, also see and feel this transformation that they are also valued. And, and I mean valued by not just not the leaders of the school necessarily, that's often the case, but by the system and by the society at large. Mm -hmm. I feel like that, the other jump that we saw, I think, was the value of educators. People all of a sudden, parents realize how difficult it is to teach two students, their two children, as opposed to 27 of them that have very different learning needs and, and are neurodiverse. And so I think that was another really interesting insight from this. I have two final questions for you because I know we're almost at time, but question one is, is really just tell us a bit more about the Global Center for Education Transformation. I'm really curious as having been involved in Salzburg now for a few years, like this seems like a real moment and, and shift in your own articulation of what's needed. So give us a sense of that. And then I've got a final question for you. So we found here that the, the number of education programs had increased um, over the last um, five or six years. Um, and that in different ways, they were all about transformation. We just hadn't articulated it like uh -huh. that before. So um you know the work that we do and you know, everything we do at Salzburg Global is done in partnership um with other organizations so the work that we do um with WISE on education leadership is, has moved more into um thinking about the role of leaders and the skills that leaders need in order to support transformation um mm -hmm. rather than incremental change or improvement um the work that we do with Children and Nature Network and the IUCN on greening school grounds and the sort of the climate education piece is kind of moving into transformation. Um, the work that we do with ETS uh, and, and QFI and other partners in the Education for Tomorrow's World mm -hmm. series is, is looking increasingly at kind of inclusive futures and what role does education play in designing and contributing to the kind of societies that will be more inclusive. So the work was all, you know, the transformation gave us a kind of an intellectual or a diff different narrative 
for how we organize and curate the different programs that we do here. I mean, so, you know, we're talking about programs like the ones that you've been part of, the, the sort of five-day residential um, ecosystem programs of bringing together groups of, of 50 people or thereabouts from around the world um, mm -hmm. using the 4i framing that we've developed. So the programs are always international, interdisciplinary, um, intergenerational and inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about the kind of collective advocacy and the work that we can do together there. Um, so, so there's that. You know, so we have six six programs a year now, more or less. Um, and then, thanks to um, the inspiring leadership campaign, which was a fundraising campaign that Salts by Global um, had been running um, for the last three years, we were also able to raise additional funds to be able to support um, the uh, to sort of support new thinking about transformation. So we have these writer residencies programs now where people can come and stay with us um, if they're working on a piece about transformation. Um, we will have opportunities for group development projects. Uh, we will have lectures. We will have more publications. Um, so always trying to contribute to the education ecosystem in, in hopefully useful ways. Brilliant, Dominic. Last question for you. Um, education transformed. What is the one thing that you would you would say kind of needs to be at the center of our efforts so that we get to a future in 2040 when someone born today graduates high school, you know, really steps into a world with a, a, having experienced a transformed education? What's the one big thing that we could change if you could only choose one? Um, identity, identity and belonging. I think the, the role that schools play in helping the experience of school plays in helping all young people um, develop their own sense of identity and how they fit into their immediate societies and into the world around them and the confidence that comes with that and understanding who you are so that you can work effectively with people who are very different to you. Um, so that idea of the, the role that education plays in more inclusive futures, I think. Fabulous. Um, Dominic Register, absolute delight to have you as part of this Education Transformed, uh, you know, a partnership between Salzburg Global Seminar and The Learning Future. And to find out more about the wonderful work that's happening at Salzburg, please check out salzburgglobal.org. Thank you for listening, and we hope to hear from you next week.